On this episode of the Application Security Podcast, Robert and I are joined by Adam Shostak, and the topic we discuss is remote threat modeling. We're all living in this new world where we're working from home or we're sheltering at home. And the question we pose is, how are we still going to make progress on rolling out threat modeling when we can't meet with people face-to-face and work directly on a whiteboard? So we hope you enjoy this special episode of the Application Security Podcast with Adam Shostak. You cannot hack yourself secure. Everyone wants to focus on the offensive side of the equation. The challenge is that developers get bored with hacking broken pieces of code after a while. Sure, it's a shiny, cool new thing in the beginning, but how about one year later? At Security Journey, we focus on long-term, sustainable security culture with the developers as defenders. Our approach integrates experimentation together with learning. We believe that developers need hands-on experience, but not at the expense of fundamental knowledge. Visit www.securityjourney.com to sign up for a free trial of the Security Dojo or schedule a demo. Hey folks, welcome to this special episode of the Application Security Podcast. This is Chris Romeo, CEO of Security Journey, and I'm also joined by my co-host, Robert. Hey, Robert. Hey, Chris. Good to be here. And Robert is a... Threat modeling architect. Which is going to fit in well with what we're going to talk about. Uh, We're also joined by Adam Shostak, who some people know from the world of threat modeling. Who am I kidding? Everybody knows that's involved in the world of threat modeling who Adam is. So, Adam, great to have you back with us again here. Hey, pleasure to be here as always. And so we find ourselves right now recording this episode. The date is March 26th, 2020. And so we're right in the throes of the COVID-19 shelter at home orders across the the country. And so we're all working from our houses right now and looking for new ways to keep up the momentum that we have in the various things we're doing in the world of security. And so what we thought we would talk about today, having Robert and Adam both here, both people who are focusing heavily on threat modeling, but now doing it remotely which a lot of our listeners are going to be dealing with the same problem as well. We thought we would spend a few minutes talking about some best practices, some lessons learned, some things about doing threat modeling remotely. So Adam, I'm going to go to you first and say, what is some of the advice you have for folks out there that are trying to take on this threat modeling thing and keep that momentum going as everybody's working from home? So the first thing... Everyone is learning to work from home as we go. This is this is new to everybody. And so recognizing that we need to really apply the agile practices of experimentation and retrospective as we figure out what's going to work so that things that we used to do at the whiteboard are now technologically mediated and that the technology doesn't get in the way, but lets the lets us do the job that we're trying to do, or even helps us do the job that we're trying to do. And so what, Adam, are some of the things that, from a tool perspective, you would recommend folks try to use, given that we're not going to be able to be face-to-face for the immediate future? So let me split the answer into threat modeling tooling and drawing tooling. In the threat modeling tooling space, OWASP just released the Threat Dragon project. I think I saw on their channel that they're going to 1.2 very soon. So that's an interesting possibility for collaboration. It's free, it's open source. There are commercial tools that I think are worth looking at at this point to figure out, does this really help me? I'm not going to sit here and talk through commercial tooling unless you really, really want to. Um, But I, I do think there's some interesting stuff in that market. And then the second part was in the drawing tool perspective that you mentioned. Yeah. So I did, I did an experiment yesterday Um, What I did was I set myself a Pomodoro timer where where I said I'm going to spend five minutes creating the same data flow diagram in each of these tools. I'm going to click the timer. 
once I'm logged in, I'm at a drawing screen, you know, with some of them, I had to sign up for accounts. Um, some others, I, I sort of got bogged down in the software installation process, but I was pleasantly surprised by the state of some of these tools and how much I was able to get done in a short time. And what are some of the tools that you took a look at there that, that our folks in the world might want to be taking a look at as well? So I took a look at five different tools. I looked at Miro. I looked at AWAPP, A-W-W-A-P-P. I looked at Jamboard from Google. I looked at Draw.io. And I looked at one called Tuple which is a pair programming environment. And all of those except Tuple have a free tier that you can go play with. And is there one based on your kind of quick analysis of looking at those tools? Is there one of those that you were like, hey, this is the one I'm going to recommend folks use? Or do you think there's there's more than one that are adequate in doing this kind of drawing of data flow diagrams remotely? There is. I was I was really surprised. I thought there were going to be more trade offs, but I really am impressed by Miro. Okay. Well, we're we're taking a look at at Miro. We've got a video stream of Miro that's available for our listeners to check out. And um, so, what are some of the things about Miro that drew you? to thinking about this as a threat modeling platform. And before you continue an answer, I'm going to say none of the three of us have anything to do with Miro. Like we have no interest in it at all other than we're threat modeling people and we want to figure out how to do this better remotely. So Miro's getting no money from us and or we're getting no money from them. And we're just we're just practitioners here. So what do you love about this, Adam? So Miro had been mentioned whenever people are doing are talking about threat modeling remotely on the OWASP Slack channel for threat modeling. Miro comes up and I poked at it a couple of years ago and I wasn't that thrilled. And I did an exercise yesterday. I spent five minutes taking a diagram that I use for my classes and trying to draw it in each of a couple of tools. And Miro was fast. It was elegant. The diagram looks decent without me having to have spent a lot of time tweaking it. And as we're discovering today, it's got a collaboration mode where I can watch each of your cursors moving around. And this diagram, by the way, is intentionally incomplete. There's stuff that's not on it. It's for a rental bike service. So why don't we just add in some componentry that we might add to a rental bike service? Okay. So we'll, yeah, we can add in a couple of different, uh, I see one thing that's definitely, uh, missing here and that is the bad people. You have no bad people here. <laughs> Who's going to be trying to steal this bike? We don't have them modeled here at all, which is a problem. We need to add some bad people. It's always where I go is the bad people and say, let's see, where do I want to put this? The, oops, 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 oops. Got a nice undo function too, I figured out. Because I'm cool. to like nice. push a lot of buttons quickly, just like Superman 3 for those people that were around in the 80s. It'll get that joke. So you know what's sort of funny is I'm watching your mouse is I can tell you have a smaller screen than I do here. Oh, I zoomed in because I got bad eyes. Ah, I couldn't see. Because I'm watching you move over like what looks like an inch from the diagram. And as you're talking, I know that you're in the little control panel over there. But my control panel is another couple inches over. So that's a that's an interesting little difference. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. So let's see. Let's add some bad people here. I keep saying I'm going to add bad people and then I'm not adding bad people. So um, I'm going to use this and I'm going to put somebody up here. We're going to call this bad people. Bike thieves. Bike thieves. Thieves. Well, good luck trying to spell thieves in a recorded <laughs> format. Hey, you know what I discovered? Because I had a couple of minutes to poke around. Is if I click the little three dots on the bottom left, on the left, there's an icon finder. Oh, nice! And so I'm just going to type "devil" in here and hit return. And holy cow, they've got a devil that looks like my threat modeling guys. <laughs> so we'll put that <laughs> up there by the bike thieves. So the bike thieves, though, are going to be interacting with the lock. So we better move the bike thieves 
down here. Okay, so we've got the lock outside of the truss boundary, right? Because the lock is in the real world. Um, mm -hmm. And so then we have a lock activator. So um, it's making me ask some questions now about your your truss boundary. So is this a self-contained electronic lock that's protecting the bike? Is that what we're what we're modeling here? So in this diagram, there's an actuator and a sensor. Right. And so the actuator would unlock the lock, uh, you know, turn a magnet on or off to let the lock move. And then there's a sensor to tell you whether or not things are closed. But, yeah, there's a physical lock that sits in the spokes and stops people from moving the bike or stops people from riding the bike. Um, well, it's not well, they're not paying us. OK. And so hmm, where's the payment processing here? So, so payment processing, we, we don't have this yet, but let me draw a little app over here and make that a solid line. So the bike talks to the Bluetooth or the bike, the app, your phone talks to the bike via Bluetooth. So we'd send a message here and label this unlock. And then the bike, and I'm not drawing in the trust boundaries just yet, but there's a cloud service up here and the app talks to the cloud service and gets, and so the unlock message would come down via payment. All that happens off the bike via, it's a little hard to read the word unlock there. It's sort of small text, but that would, the app talks to the cloud service, the cloud service talks to a payment back end. And, you know, the thing I like about this as an example threat model is we've got some IoT, we've got some mobile, we've got some cloud, we've got some payment all in a all in a package that's a little bit fun to think about how it might work in the real world. Hey, I can change the nature of a shape. That's pretty cool. Let's make this payments.bank.com. I'm not loving any of the icons for the cyber criminal, but so I'm going to go with just a jail cell. All right, that's where they're going to well, end up eventually. You know, I think I think there's a way to stick your own app or your own. You can do a web page capture here. Mm -hmm. So if you just put your your picture in a in an app, or maybe it's the upload. Yeah, I can upload a file. Um, let me try uploading something and seeing what happens. Well, I'm going to finish my data flow diagrams here. Or at least my data, my data connectors is what I'm working on now. So I've got meat space, bike thieves. They're going to attack. There the you market. go. So yeah, you can upload. You can upload a file and just include it. Okay, so that's a good, good. That's a nice feature. So. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think what we're seeing here is the three of us are collaboratively working on a threat model. And we could, if we had somebody who was brand new to threat modeling, we could be letting them do the work while we're doing the talking and just asking mm -hmm. questions, which that's the way that I've always taught threat modeling is to say, let's talk about threat modeling for about five minutes where I describe it. And then what I'm going to do is have you draw me a picture and I'm just going to start asking questions about it. Some some questions I'll know the answer to, others I won't. And that's okay. I'm fine with it. I'm just going to ask lots of questions to see what you're able to, you know, how you're able to adjust the diagram and connect with how the thing actually works. Hence the reason I asked about the payments, because you always want to follow the money. But that's just... And, and you're saying I did the right thing there. I just started drawing the way you expected me to draw, huh? Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's... You know, the, you start thinking about, well, the, the bike's app has to sit outside the trust boundary. There's no way you can say that's unless you had some type of a trusted device, which we're not there yet in this world. Um, the cloud service, there's probably what we're seeing here is there's actually multiple threat models now jumping out off the page. And mm -hmm. we're, we're starting to get to a macro threat model, which is, I think, always a danger early, early on, because you can end up with a picture that's has so many pieces that nobody can ever understand it. And from my perspective, I'm a simple guy. We got to keep it simple if you want me to be able to understand it. And so that's that's one of the challenges that we could have in, in, in using this type of format is we could get too complicated too fast. 
Well, you know, that's a danger that exists with the whiteboard as well. And and so I think it's okay. really important as we break this out and say what's new in the world of threat modeling in this world where we're all working remotely. You're right. We can make the same mistakes that we can make at home when we're in the office using right. these tools. The, the thing that excited me when I started looking at this was how quickly I was able to start drawing, get something that looks better than anything else I draw without a lot of effort. We're collaborating in this tool. I think people should give it a shot. Yeah, totally. Totally. Agree. Can we get an affiliate link? <laughs> <laughs> we should. We but, should. Yeah. So you're trying to minimize the friction of the tool itself to get you to, you know, similar to what you would have with a whiteboard, right? Yes. Yes. That's, I, that's love, the I love what you said. So we've definitely had a really good experience I have in in being able to work collaboratively with you guys. I think it would be great for us to quickly summarize the challenges we had kicking off this Miro session, just so folks mm -hmm. are thinking about some of the challenges that they may encounter when they start trying to use this tool with some of their devs. And so um, we had to sign up for an account. That account had to be... We, we had to go through the process of um, so, you know, proving that we, we owned the email address and we, so we owned the account. Uh, so there was some setup that had to be done here. So what, what, else, what else went into the setup process? So I found a data flow diagram template when, when I just came on and started searching the tools. There's a little shape and I can go to all shapes. Where was it? I forget exactly where it was, but there was a, what sort of diagram do you want to create? When I typed in DFD, I didn't find it. But when I Googled for data flow diagram in Miro, I found something very quickly. And so I used that to get going. So I think the takeaway there for our listeners that might be trying to do this is it will be wise of you to have a template slash sample threat model like Adam had here as a place to start, it would have been a lot more difficult, especially if you have somebody who's brand new to threat modeling. It'll be a lot more difficult for them to watch you build this threat model for 10 minutes. And it won't be a great use of their time. And they're going to wonder, what are these people doing? Why, why aren't they talking to me? And so I think that's one of the, what the, one of the best practices we're seeing here is, you know, make sure you understand how to set up the tool, how to educate the person you're trying to teach in how, what they need to do in advance but then also come to the conversation ready with like a sample DFD like Adam had here. And you can see we started playing around with it. And now we've got all kinds of, you know, extensions that we've made to it. But it was collaboratively where we did that work and we all learned something in that process. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. So let's let's kind of cycle back now to um, some of the other kind of best practice things that we're thinking about here. And Adam, I want to touch on one thing that you mentioned earlier in our conversation. And then Robert, I'm going to come to you for kind of your thoughts on best practices. But Adam, you mentioned a couple of commercial tools. And we don't normally talk a lot about commercial tools, but I think there are some tools that that we all would agree we like. And once again, they didn't pay anything to have us talk about them um, on this show. But I still, as a practitioner, want to be able to share that information with the world. And so, um, Adam, what are your thoughts then on tools? We talked about Threat Dragon. Obviously, that's a great one for people. Uh, open source, it's free. And, uh, but, it's, but it is not, it's not, I wouldn't describe Threat Dragon as an enterprise ready tool. So, what mm. are some of the other things that you're thinking about? Um, when when you're talking about these commercial tools, let's just let's just call them out and say what they are. Sure. So the one the one that I like the most is Continuum's Arius Risk. And the thing I like about it is it's very oriented towards an enterprise and working across lots of threat models. And and I should mention that I like it enough that I'm on their advisory board. And, but to me, the way they're thinking about the problem is very much aligned with the way I think about the problem. 
Yeah, and I'm I'm a fan of uh, of various risks from Continuum as well. Um, Stephen DeVries has been on the podcast here before, uh, so he's a friend of the show. And yeah, I mean, we I, I agree with what you're saying as well. I mean, this is a a tool that's worth taking a look at from an enterprise perspective uh, because it does give you that next level. How are we going to manage this across the board? You know, Adam, from your days at Microsoft, my days at Cisco, like we're used to this scaling this at a big scale, and mm-hmm. you know, I love Threat Dragon. Um, I'm a fan of it, but I wouldn't roll it out when I was at Cisco. It wouldn't have, it, it wasn't ready yet. It wasn't battle tested from an enterprise perspective to be able to manage all those individual threat models and keep track of them. And so, yeah, that's a good thing. Good thing to think about and definitely recommend folks take a look at, um, that area's risk. It's a good tool. Yeah. And I think the, the thing to think about as your listeners are asking, what tool do I want? is do I want a drawing tool like Miro that allows me to create these diagrams, get consensus around what we're working on, where the trust boundaries are, how it's put together, what the components are so that we can be comprehensive, and then we'll manage our threat modeling work and we'll do the analysis of what can go wrong and we'll track that in a word doc or something or or do you want a, a tool that takes more of it on and shapes your behavior a little bit and there's a real there's a real trade off there cuz however much you like the tool the tool makes assumptions about what you should do and encodes them in the rules that the software has. The thing that I really liked about Miro when I picked it up yesterday was just how fluid it felt. And I hear from some people that they feel that a tool like Continuum is very fluid for them. I hear from other people that they've got their processes that they've built out. And so do we do we keep with the workflow that we have with the organizational process that we have? The the move to remote is just really important as an opportunity to say, maybe it's time to put in a little more structure, help people get the work done. So let's come back around now to uh, some of Robert's thoughts about remote threat modeling. As somebody who's a practitioner who's actually doing this on a day-by-day basis, Robert, what are some of the best practices that you would share with our audience? Well, I think we've covered a lot of them already. Um, you know, making sure everybody has uh, similar tools, um, making that decision. I, I, I do like uh, what Adam mentioned. You, you do need to make a decision on how you approach threat modeling, either from the drawing tool perspective and we keep track separately, which is very similar to what you would do with the whiteboard uh, many times, or you go and take a look at a tool that will help you navigate uh, through finding threats or identifying threats and uh, follow up and, and so forth. So I think that's a, that's a really good point is to make that decision. Uh, but secondly, working remotely, of course, you need to make sure you have good uh, remote tools in place, uh, whether that be tools that, uh, like we've been looking at here, that, that naturally allow uh, good collaboration inside the tool, or you use other video screen sharing tools uh, that, uh, that allows uh, multiple uh, folks to, to see a screen or see multiple screens at the same time, something along those lines. Um, so that, that's also a factor as well that, that can uh, help you with either being successful or causing more friction. <laughs> so that's the other thing you have to kind of weigh uh, in those decisions as well. And Adam, it looks like you got some other questions here. Based on the no, drive. no, I was I, I was just modeling the behavior. I was taking some notes um, in the app as as Robert was talking. Oh, that's great. No, and I think you you did touch on something there in the notes that um, is I think even goes a step further, and that is what are we doing from a uh, video collaboration perspective? Like we're we're actually recording a podcast now, so we're not actually looking at video of each other. But is that something that's going to be important in this remote world when we're doing threat modeling remotely? Do we need, is it good for us to be able to see the look on each other's faces? Yeah. And, and I hear, I hear both. I hear sometimes, uh, no, not so much. We're just focused on, uh, for example, a whiteboard, we're focused on that. So let's just do that. And then I hear the other side where 
and I was seeing the other side where, uh, okay, no, we need to see each other. Uh, we need to make sure we're engaged. Uh, there's that, that aspect of when I'm working at a whiteboard, it's not that I'm just working at the whiteboard, but I'm actually talking to people and communicating. And I could see, uh, they may not say something, but the, you know, quizzing look on their face Mm. I'm not sure where where are you going with that. I could see that in a camera, perhaps. Uh, so so there is that that still that personal interaction. As much as as we're trying to capture that, working remotely, if we can do that, then it helps. Uh, just as we would be, it would help rather if we're at a whiteboard. Uh, so that's another thing to make a decision about too: is how do we share? Do we just share the thing we're looking at, or do we share that as as well as uh, turning on the camera so that we can see reactions and 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 make sure people are engaged, uh, you know, uh, especially if you have a larger number uh, of folks who are trying to do threat modeling at the same time, you know, a good sized team. Uh, you might have two or three people who are actually doing the threat model, working on the threat model or da- data flow diagram or, or, or talking about it. And then you've got maybe five people who are sitting in multitasking, doing something else. And I may not be engaged because, hey, they're remote and there's no camera on me. No one knows type of thing. And and so you sometimes have to make that decision as well, that maybe turning on the camera kind of forces us to be engaged and and, and be there and, um, you know, verify that we're, we can see each other and, and react and so forth. And that, that makes me think as a teacher of threat modeling. Something we need to do in this remote world is we need to be checking in with the people we're working with directly in the collaboration. And I think we did a good, good job of that in our little collaborative example here because we were kind of constantly checking in with each other and and drawing each other into the conversation. But I think that's something we got to do as as trainers, as teachers of threat modeling. We got to be deliberate about that. And if somebody is kind of appeared to drift it away, we got to ask him a question like, you know, if let's say Robert had been silent here for five, five minutes or something, uh, I need to do something as the trainer to say, hey, Robert, you know, what do you think about the GPS radio module here? What's the impact of that? And so I'm not calling you out by saying, hey, Robert, are you paying attention? I'm just drawing you back into this remote collaborative experience. And for us as trainers, we got to be paying attention to that stuff as teachers because we, we don't want anybody to miss out on the cool stuff that's happening right in front of them. Right. Yeah, and I think I think as everyone is learning to go remote, there's a really interesting difference between the companies that have been remote for a while. And I'll talk to a lot of people where, oh, God, no, I don't turn on my camera ever. I tell people it's broken. <laughs> the, the, the folks who are going remote now, almost all of the advice that I'm hearing – is that your camera is on most of the time. Manager's open door policy is they have a Google Hangout or a Zoom call that's open just showing them. And if you want to walk into that room, the URL is available to you. And, And that willingness to share, willingness to expose the inside of our homes as messy as they are, as our pets, as our kids come in frame and wave to our coworkers. I think there's a tolerance for that that really enables what Robert was talking about with being able to see whether or not people are engaged or if they're looking quizzical or if they're sitting there with their arms crossed and frowning. All of these things are things that we're all working through, that companies are working through. What should our culture be? What is the expectation here for the way we're going to do this? And 90% of that just applies to the way you're going to threat model. And then there's the 10% that's different because threat modeling involves these new skills, this critical thinking, and the specific tooling that we're going to use to make it work. But so much of what we're doing today is just let's figure out how to make this – let's figure out how to work in a world where we have to be physically distant from one another. Yeah, definitely. So as we close out this little segment we did on remote threat modeling and some best practices and things for folks to think about, Adam, I'll start with you. What's 
what's kind of one thing that you would leave with our audience as a conclusion coming out of this session? Question number four in threat modeling is, did we do a good job? Make the time to talk about that. Make the time to learn what's really working and what's not working and everything will go better. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. What's your kind of takeaway here for the audience? Yeah, I think similar. Uh, Just checking in. I think follow up what you mentioned there, just checking in uh, with all the members in the, in the team and and making sure they uh, feel like they're, they're a part. Well, gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to share with our audience today. Like we said, this is a special episode of the Application Security Podcast that uh, we want to get out to our folks in our audience that are dealing with some of these issues right now. And um, I, th- I would say that we would be open to, if folks in the audience want to ping us on the OWASP Slack or, or, or uh, you know, on Twitter or any other, any other places where we're hanging out, uh, we would love to continue this conversation and hear their best practices and thoughts as well on remote threat modeling. Thanks for listening to the Application Security Podcast. You'll find the show on Twitter at AppSec Podcast or on the web at www.securityjourney.com slash application dash security dash podcast. You can also find Chris on Twitter at EdgeRoute and Robert at Robert Hurlbutt. Remember, security is a journey, not a destination.